All right, good evening, everyone, and uh, we'll call the uh, council meeting March 9th uh, to order. Uh, first, we just start off, <coughs> excuse me, by acknowledging that we're gathering today on the traditional territories of the Coast and Strait Salish people, specifically the Lekwungen speaking people, known today as the Esquimalt and the Songhees First Nations, and their connections to this land continues to this day. I also just want to remind people that the, our video, uh, our council meetings are live streamed and then the video is archived for future viewing on our website. Um, just note that there's a slightly modified agenda in front of us with just a couple of pieces of correspondence added and a, uh, a small correction on one of the staff reports. Um, first up, we have minutes and reports. We have four minutes here. Uh, we can treat them all individually or if anybody has changes, we can treat them individually. Um, move approval of all four sets of minutes. Second. Thank you. I'm just, people seem to having a couple of hard time with some technical things there. Is everybody okay? Yeah, Councillor Patterson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. <coughs> just on the minutes of February 24th, I believe that um, the minutes still say, uh, and this is, uh, this is in regard to. So it's um, the public hearing of the council meeting. Yeah. Uh, so the public hearing minutes or the council oh, meeting no. minutes? Oh, no, sorry, the council meeting. Okay. The, the, uh, yeah, the, well, I guess it was in the public hearing minutes. The, um, uh, the direct, it said the director of building and planning advised the staff publish a consolidated version of the OCP following amendments. And I believe that we agreed that it was that staff will publish a consolidated version of the OCP following the amendments because we've never had one yet. Sure. Can you just, uh, which section are you looking at? Ms. Rella? Uh, Your Worship, it would be uh, section four. Uh, council request for clarification and the note reads the director of building and planning advised that staff publish a consolidated version of the OCP following amendments and list all amendments so the public is aware of what is included in that consolidation. Okay, I read that as a future forward statement, not as a, that's okay. Yes, it does. If that was the intent of it, then I'm fine with it. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Councilor Patterson. Any other Suggested corrections, changes? Seeing none, I will move all four. We'll call all four together. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed. Thank you. Uh, mayor's remarks. I have a, a few more than usual today. Uh, just uh, just some interesting things that have happened in the last week or so. One, uh, this last weekend, uh, I was by pleasure, along with Sanich, to host the BC Association of Police Board uh, Conference. So we had uh, 14 municipal and transit police forces, uh, First Nations police forces, uh, join us uh, for a conference talking about all things uh, related to police board governance, uh, operational changes, uh, uh, and it was very, very well attended and uh, and very appreciate the uh, the support of Saanich in co-hosting that. Um, also had a chance to meet with Selena Robinson, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, just talking about some of their housing initiatives. Uh, also, we had our quarterly mayor's lunch, uh, where we also talked about a number of regional uh, issues uh, as a group of uh, local mayors. Um, also, uh, everybody here attended the uh, municipal dinner. This is an annual dinner uh, held to uh, just to thank uh, all the volunteers who serve on the various committees, commissions. And I'd just uh, like to thank uh, Cindy Denemy and Councillor Braithwaite and all, and uh, Deb Hopkins and Haley Goodgrove and all the people who contributed so much to make that a success. Uh, it was very well appreciated by all those who attended. And um, uh, just a little update, I had a chance to meet with the organizers of the Francophonia Games coming this, this summer. And they are uh, more or less on track with their core fundraising portions of it, so they expect that to, to come forward. Um, it'll be interesting to see if there's any impact of the coronavirus on their plans. Um, but at this point, things are still moving ahead. And um, there's also uh, just a heads up to the community. The Oak Bay uh, High School Alumni Association, which was so instrumental in raising the 110000 or so for the piano for the high school, 
uh, has offered to uh, the uh, fundraise match for uh, an effort to raise money to uh, replace the uh, the track at Oak Bay High School. So there's a, a significant effort going on right now to raise money for that uh, as, a, as, a, as a legacy of those games for the community. Um, I also just uh, will finish just touching base briefly on the COVID-19 uh, coronavirus. Um, we do uh, uh, just are watching, I guess is probably I would say at this point, the uh, developing situation of the coronavirus, um, COVID-19. It's, uh, we have the confirmed number of cases is not large as of this date. Obviously, we had our first death in the province today, uh, and there's quite a bit of concern around. So we would reiterate what all the public health people are saying and uh, try and um, take precautions of hand washing hands. You'll notice uh, we have social separation for the most part in this in this area today. We're trying to keep people seated as far as part as possible uh, in the effort to support uh, that as well. And I just uh, wanted to just uh, express, I think, for Council's uh, edification and probably the public's as well. Um, there's been a lot of work going on uh, behind the scenes with staff over the last few weeks, uh, last two weeks in particular. Uh, so working um, with all the department heads, the protective services, uh, in conjunction with the, uh, the health uh, authorities, uh, just to make sure that we're on track. But interestingly, one of the, th the side effects, and uh, Council Jelke would appreciate this in the emergency response uh, piece, um, they made a effort to, to categorize and quantify the various services that the municipality puts forward. So I think we're up to 87 or so, under 90 different services. Um, our Director of Strategic Initiatives, uh, Ms. Bay, has been leading this. And uh, so working with all the department heads has been prioritizing them with the effort. So if there is a requirement for a number of people who are, you know, to, that are sick and can't attend work, um, that the services are being prioritized in a way appropriate to keep the, uh, the key services of the municipality working. So I just want to express my thanks to staff for all that work that's going on. Uh, and it's nice to see sort of the forethought. And the plus side is that, uh, frankly, that prioritization and, and matrix is actually quite helpful for any incident where we may have some shortage. So that is the summary of my response. Uh, we are now up to item number three on the agenda, and this is the public participation period. It's a chance for anybody who wishes to come forward and speak to Council on matters of interest uh, to the community. You're more than welcome to do so. We have up to 20 minutes allocated in the meeting, uh, and each speaker is allowed up to three minutes each. Uh, and at this point, I'll just invite anybody who wishes to speak to come forward. Uh, and this is, uh, yeah, please do. If, if anybody wishes to address Council, this is the time to do so. Not seeing anyone. Okay. In that case, we will move on to the next item on the agenda. I just also see former Councillor Michelle Kirby here in the audience. So welcome, former Councillor Kirby. Um, item number four on the agenda, climate action budget items. Uh, we have a report here from the manager of planning, and we have a presentation, I believe, from uh, a representative from UBC is coming. Welcome, sir. Uh, Ms. Jensen, do you wish to make an introduction? Thank you, Your Worship. So just as a bit of background, Council created the Community Climate Action Working Group last November with its mandate to provide up to five climate action recommendations. Council would then consider those recommendations for inclusion into their strategic priorities and upcoming budget cycle. In February, the first three recommendations of the working group were presented to Council, which included determining the feasibility of and building an active transportation network by the end of 2025 establishing an annual funding program to provide grants and rebates that would encourage community climate action and reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the community, and initiating a neighborhood engagement program that would trigger community initiatives beginning with the Cool Kit program. Out of that, Council did have a few questions about the proposed initiatives, including use of the Climate Action Reserve Fund and the Cool Kit program. So with respect to the reserve fund, that fund was established in 2012 for the purpose of funding projects that reduce carbon footprint. To the best of staff's knowledge, there are no external restrictions on this fund or any re resolutions that Council might limit its use. So should Council choose to use the fund, they could be utilized for the climate action initiatives as proposed. For the Cool Kit program, staff have provided additional information as to the cost breakdown of the three-year UBC-supported program. Year one has a cost estimate of 66000 which includes more extensive support by UBC, including staff training, customization of the program for Oak Bay, designing and conducting a neighbourhood program for one identified neighbourhood, and developing an engagement strategy. 
UBC staff support is fairly extensive for the first year, translating to a full-time position for a six to nine month period. The subsequent two years also offer support from UBC, but at a, at a lesser level as both staff and local champions continue to roll out the program throughout the community. In the long term, staff provide an oversight role, ensuring the program continues to build throughout the community through identified organizations and individual residents. The Cool Kit program is designed to have each neighborhood take ownership of the climate actions they identify. So as the program continues to expand through the community, Council could expect to see different actions being undertaken in different areas. For example, you may see more intensive tree planting in some areas versus carpooling or group heat pump purchases in other areas. Each program really is tailored for the identified wants and actions of the residents. So in the interest of Council's consideration of the Cool Kit program, tonight we have uh, Dr. Stephen Shepard visiting us from UBC to speak to the program a bit more. Uh, I will therefore turn it over to Chris Heidley, who's been instrumental in arranging Dr. Shepard's uh, visit with us to introduce him. Thanks. Welcome, Mr. Heidley. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Dr. Shepard is a professor in the, in the Forest Research Management at the University of British Columbia. He teaches in uh, landscape and climate change planning, community engagement, and visualization. He has served as a director at UBC's, uh, UBC's Urban Forest Program and directs a collaborative for advanced landscape planning as uh, an interdisciplinary group which works with communities on develop developing climate change and energy solutions. His research interests include engaging citizens in low carbon resilient communities, sea level rise planning, renewable energy planning, and energy effects of urban forestry and video games as an educational tool on climate change. Uh, Dr. Shepard leads the UBC Research Cluster of Excellence on Cool Tools, social, social Mobilization Using Digital Tools. He has published four books and numerous peer-reviewed articles on visioning and visualization methods, public perception, and community engagement. Dr. Shepard is here tonight to talk about the Neighborhood Engagement Program for Education and Climate Action with the Citizens Cool Kit. And I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Shepard. Welcome, Dr. Shepard. In fact, you were here not long ago doing a talk at uh, Windsor Pavilion, I believe. Uh, well, welcome back. If I just get you to turn on the microphone in front of you and uh, point it towards you, then uh, everybody here and at home can hear you. Okay, I'm just trying to get the slides to click on that. It worked before, then we took it. <laughs> it worked before, didn't yeah, it, Chris? Yeah, it did. <laughs> when the AV person was here, it was working just fine. Ah, there it is, yes, seeing it. But there you go, that, that should be good. Uh, except that that's at the end, so I will run back to the... So, uh, take it back to the beginning. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introductions and thanks for the invitation to uh, participate in the Council uh, Committee as a whole tonight. Uh, so, uh, we wanted to uh, address some of the uh, questions that came up in previous discussions with the uh, um, Council and the uh, Climate Action Working Group um, through a, a short slideshow that explains a little bit about some of the how, how this program works and what the proposal specifically uh, suggests. See if this works. Yeah, it's good. Okay. So, uh, probably don't need to go into this very much, so I'll do this rather quickly. But the need for scaling up climate action uh, as it relates to communities like Oak Bay talk a little bit about the process and outcomes that are intended for this, this program, um, and then explain a little bit more about the details of the uh, training and engagement workshops that are envisaged, and a, a few details about the budget to explain uh, where, the, where the costs go and what that means. And I'm happy to take uh, any questions during the, discu the discussion, if you like. Uh, so obviously, there are many things that climate change uh, means for uh, local communities. It's uh, an area of work we've been studying for uh, well over a decade. And all of the kind of doom and gloom things that we are worried about and that people know about to some extent um, are, are, are real, obviously, um, and they have local implications. And it's very important we think about the local solutions to those, not just the, the, the doom and gloom stuff. Um, basically, many neighbors will need to be climate-proofed in some way. 
um, and this is, can be a collective process rather than just individual households. Um, but for example, we will need to uh, retrofit homes. We will need to change how we uh, use transportation uh, and the landscapes and the green spaces will have critical roles to play in that. Uh, and in order to meet obviously the, the policies and the guidelines and the targets that we've set ourselves in the climate emergency, uh, including what has happened in Oak Bay. This is, is actually one of the visualizations that Chris referred to. Uh, there's actually a before view and an after view, but this is a view in North Vancouver. Uh, and what you're actually seeing are existing homes, but we have, through the magic of Photoshop, uh, modified them with a, a variety of sort of techniques for how you might retrofit a whole neighborhood. Uh, and these are all climate actions, both for mitigation, reducing carbon footprints, and adapting to the impacts to increase resilience. So you'll see, for example, stormwater swales for improved drainage when you have more intense rainstorms, uh, solar panels on roofs for local energy resilience, uh, local food production to reduce food miles, uh, obviously a lot of active transportation, transit, electric vehicles, uh, and even in, in some cases uh, creating uh, local um, shops and things like that in neighborhoods where uh, like in North Van, it's very hard to actually walk somewhere where you can actually buy anything because um, it's just too far away. I don't think Oak Bay actually has that problem too bad. Um, but the idea is there's a menu of many different solutions that need to be thought about and then communities have to figure out which ones would be applicable, affordable, uh, and, and a reasonable thing to do to reduce their risk and reduce their footprints. Uh, urban forests are an important part of that puzzle, uh, are certainly not the whole story. But uh, we sometimes take for granted how many of the services they provide to a community. And uh, in terms of climate change, they're a, they're a source of, of mitigation through uh, things like reducing their conditioning needs, uh, sequestering carbon, as well as adapting to much hotter climates. We have probably four degrees of extra temperature on average in, in the summer. Um, and so trees will be a, a major, and shade will be a major issue. Um, as well as many benefits, air quality, uh, residential health, obviously they beautify our neighborhoods, neighborhoods etc. Um, and ecological benefits as well. Uh, these are a couple of shots from uh, Vancouver, but uh, uh, we know we're seeing decline in many mature trees uh, broadly due to things like drought and, and other pressures. So the solutions are really what we should be thinking about and, and so Programs like this one, and there are, there are several other good programs out there um, that, f that encourage communities to take steps now before uh, it's, uh, the time, too much time passes by on things like tree planting, better stewardship of, of public trees as well as private trees during droughts or extreme conditions, which can really threaten the health of trees. Uh, local food, um, both public and private land, these kinds of things are actions that many communities could be taking now. So the question is how to mobilize communities to scale up to meet the climate emergency and meet some of these ambitious targets. That's what the Citizens Cool Kit has been designed to do. Uh, we've been working on this for uh, well over five years to develop and test the Cool Kit. Um, and I just wanted to touch on some of the principles, some of the quick steps of the Cool Kit and talk about uh, some ways that this program can work. Uh, basically, it is making climate change local, um, fitting the local place, using collective activities, um, using things like visual tools and social rewards to really incentivize uh, people. And basically, to make positive action around climate change, people can actually have fun, get to know their neighbors a lot better, and build resilience through those social connections. And really trying to get some visible things on the ground uh, we've explored things like thermal imaging for uh, heat efficiency and trying to ex explain where we're losing money on energy. Uh, there are many good uh, examples where people have um, engaged with their urban forest, like in Melbourne where they, people were emailing their trees. I think you've probably heard about that example as a way of building those connections and increasing that understanding of what the, the tree's benefits can be. Uh, we've been looking at a lot of other programs, like the Green Block program run by Evergreen in Vancouver, where uh, over the course of three years, they've been able to reduce 
ecological footprint significantly and some fairly major changes in car use, natural gas use, this kind of thing, and legacy projects like community gardens. So these things can work. Um, they've just not been scaled up until very recently. So that's really what the cool kit's intended to do. It's, it's intended as do it yourself, but really we know that it needs some social organization, some community organizing to keep momentum and keep more people, get more people involved and keep them interested. So it's kind of a one-stop shop. It addresses many aspects of climate change. Um, and there's a, a process, a five-step process um, that is in the cool kit. I should have brought my copy, but I have some copies here if you'd like to actually see a physical copy. It's all online as well. Um, basically, uh, getting a community conversation going about the local neighborhood level impacts of climate change and solutions, um, some mapping exercises, uh, actually we get people to rate their own block and sort of compare uh, with other blocks in the neighborhood as a kind of a fun competitive kind of thing, and then visioning the future and developing an action plan. Uh, the image on the right shows one of the popular uh, quests, this one happens to be one on urban forestry, uh, and it's getting people to uh, think about their own local forest, uh, urban forest, in a very different way and start to understand what those impacts are. The leaping squirrel test is where they have to figure out if a squirrel can get from one end of the block to the other without coming down to the ground uh, as a very crude index of how much shade and how much canopy have we actually got. Uh, and we make them do that on the street and then in the alleys, in some cases, the, uh, the canopy is great, in some cases, the canopy is not so great. And that's, the, uh, it, that's a fun exercise that people can do with their kids but it teaches them uh, a, a lot about the trees and what they can uh, offer. Uh, so we've had a good feedback. We've tested this with high schools and with um, several different uh, communities uh, in Metro Vancouver. Um, and people enjoy and, uh, and find transformative going through these exercises in communities, even areas they know very well. They've never looked at them this way before. The visioning is, is, a, is a fun part of it, which is literally drawing on a printed out street view and imagining what changes might happen and what changes they would like to see to improve their neighborhood. It's quick, uh, it's fun, it's a collective exercise. Uh, you can see what one of the teachers have said from Vancouver School Board from a workshop a, a year or two ago. Um, and so there are many things that people come up with and some inspiring ideas and some occasionally wacky things occasionally, but it gets them into that mind frame. And that uh, is carried through to developing an action plan, um, which obviously has to consider a lot of feasibility and consistency with local policy. Uh, we've done testing of this, we are uh, researchers, and um, we've consistently found significant increases in knowledge, understanding, sometimes concern, um, awareness of targets, things like that, that many people were not previously aware of. You can see some of those changes before and after. Um, and so the idea of scaling up, uh, you know, neighborhood associations, which uh, are pretty important in most communities, um, could be hubs for training uh, and organizing these kinds of activities. Youth groups, uh, urban forestry students to help people do tree planting, things like that are all possible ways of doing it. I'm gonna skip that one. Um, so just to bring you up to date, uh, we are in the middle of a process with Vancouver Park Board in their Kalani neighborhood using their, um, the Kalani Community Center, much like your recreational centers here, uh, on this Cool Hood Champs program. So this is an idea to, uh, a program to recruit and train local citizens who are interested in doing something positive about climate change and trying to uh, give them the tools, empower them to engage some of their own uh, friends, family, neighbors. Um, again, following some of these other models that we've seen and building on the cool kit that we know has been successful. Um, and so just last week, uh, we had one of the participants say, is the only good news I've heard about climate change in a long time. Um, so it's really emphasizing the positive rather than the, the more depressing aspects. And just to uh, be a little clearer how this works, at least in, in Kilani, um, we have the Vancouver Park Board as being the initiator, um, but, and we at CALP and our graduate students, and our urban forestry students are involved in uh, these workshops. Uh, they're held at the hub, which is com the community center, but hubs could be schools or churches um, or libraries. Um, and there we train the champions and the champions then 
go out and work in their own neighborhoods with the people that they know. So we're using the existing networks, the existing infrastructure to channel this kind of new inf information to people. Most people have not thought about all of these things before. Uh, so this is really just the breakdown of how it might work for Oak Bay, uh, and uh, we probably don't need to go through every part of this, but I wanted to explain um, the budget that will be coming up, the budget breakdown, um, and year one, which is the main year for establishing the program, working closely with um, district staff, with local community associations, other, other uh, NGO groups, um, to uh, develop a, a staff training session to sort of get people familiar with uh, how the cool kit works and how these training programs might work. Uh, and get feedback. It's a very much an interactive process. Uh, basically co-design that program. Customize the cool kit itself so that it reflects the character of Oak Bay, the photographs, the policies, the, the kind of content, uh, so that it looks and feels like Oak Bay and not like Vancouver or Victoria or somewhere like that. Um, and then a series of three workshops which start out with the champions, which is very similar to what we're doing in Killarney right now, start with uh, the people who are interested in potentially being champions and learning more how to do that, and then uh, spreading that out over the next two workshops to bringing in more citizens, probably from some selected blocks and sort of mini neighborhoods within Oak Bay, and try and get those, those selected areas working uh, with the hubs that they're linked to. And then uh, sort of a celebration uh, workshop, probably this is probably about nine months out nine to 12 months, we'd have to work out the exact schedule, um, to reward and document and publicize what they've been able to achieve, what they've done, and build interest in the program. Uh, so this is a kind of a back of the envelope map, <laughs> but um, just off a, a simple Google Earth plot. But w uh, we thought, uh, I think the question came up is how big is a neighborhood? What sort of scale does this work at? So the map in the middle is, if, if you like, the middle section of Oak Bay. It seems like there are sort of three main areas, north, central, south. And this is the central section sort of uh, focused on, uh, you know, Oak Bay Road and the area to the north of it. And the blue dots are um, p possible hub locations for things like schools, uh, the recreation centers, a library, maybe there are some uh, even uh, churches or things like that that have a, a, a grew have a, um, a network already, um, and these could become uh, focal points for meetings and discussions and sort of um, provide maybe some some local uh, organization to local teams. And the idea is to get people from these various blocks, and there are roughly 90 to 100 blocks in this area. Um, and they could be organized around these hubs. There's maybe six, seven, or eight of these hubs. Uh, and you get these kind of super block, 10, 12, 15 blocks. And if they work together, then that's building some social cohesion, but it's also allowing them to combine their talents and find you know, common solutions. So that's how we might build the reach. You might start with a few of those that are most interested um, and develop some of those sort of action plans for those specific neighborhoods. Year two would be more about um, uh, trying to expand that coverage so that there would be further blocks coming online, more hubs, um, more uh, training workshops. Um, but there we would be stepping back and, and the staff and the NGOs or whoever the community groups are that are gonna uh, run with some of these activities would by then have sort of seen how the process works and feel more confident in being able to take on some of those roles, but we would continue to review, advise, uh, evaluate, that kind of thing. Um, and then we can bring in students, a student intern program with trained uh, students who are good at, um, have experience in engagement, uh, climate change background, urban forestry background, these kinds of things, to actually assist local people with uh, local projects. These could be tree planting, it could be rain gardens, it could be um, providing uh, better information on pollinator corridors or composting schemes or things like that. Um, so uh, this program really would need to be, uh, say, designed and developed collectively, a co-design process. Um, and the budget for year one, which is where most of the money would, would be spent, um, that comes from your, your budgets, um, 
would be basically, uh, it, it actually funds a team um, for running and organizing um, with, and working closely with staff, um, that series of four workshops, basically. So we need boots on the ground, we need people to be able to, our own team to build some trust. So you, uh, local people are familiar with us and with the community um, uh, folks who are gonna be leading this. Um, so several trips, I think we assumed about 10 to 12 round trips at least to, to establish that. Most of these workshops are either one day or half day workshops. Take quite a bit of organization and planning. Um, and um, for those, we usually have at least two people. Um, so it, uh, while the budget allows for about one, it's equivalent of one full-time person over the year, it's really more likely to be uh, a half-time person and uh, um, other supporting graduate students and researchers. Um, I would be there. Uh, I am come at no cost. Um, because I'm paid by the province, so at least at the moment. So, um, so there are a number of benefits that come with that, obviously, and uh, um, hopefully this is good value for money in terms of uh, trying to build a program that could actually work. It's informed by evidence and research, but um, is um, you know fitted to the local community uh, with your help. I would be happy to talk more about any of these details on costs. Um, but in the interest of time, maybe I should stop there and uh, we can come back to this if you like if you have questions. Much of this information is, is online. Uh, it's all open source. There's no real um, uh, uh, barriers or limits or ongoing costs. It's intended for communities to use and, in, and um, incorporate in their you know, sort of, uh, daily activities, if you like. Um, so we hope it's very compatible with the climate action plan that you have. And with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shepard. And, and I just, yeah, we are here today not to make decisions on this, but uh, uh, we did have more questions. And the fact that you're here to answer those is, uh, is terrific. I really appreciate you coming over to, uh, to answer questions. Uh, are there questions of staff or Dr. Shepard from yes, Councilor Green? Through you, Mayor, to Dr. Shepard, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I know it's hard to turn around to look. Um, I just wanted to ask you, do you have any sense of the level of success thus far with the Cool Kit program and the training? How is it playing out at, at, at the key, uh, community neighborhood level? Thank you. Yeah, so as I said, we've been, we've been working on it, developing and testing this with communities for uh, several years. Um, and, and so we can measure success in terms of do they show up uh, do they learn something? Do they, does it change how they think and perceive their environment? And are they motivated? What we're not yet able to do is track, uh, uh, you know, things like GHG emission reductions. Not, we haven't had enough time, and uh, we need uh, we need these kind of ongoing programs, two, three, four year, five year programs to really be able to measure that. What we can say. Uh, and I'll come back to the training program because we've had some very nice feedback on that in the short term, um, is that the, the program builds on a number of methods <coughs> on programs like Green Block, Cool Block in California, uh, the SNAP program in Toronto, the LEAF program in Toronto. Um, and th those have been running long enough on, on a narrower scope of activities usually to, to actually see uh, th things like energy uh, improvements, <laughs> energy upgrades, uh, CO2 reductions. I showed you, I think, the green block process. That was at the end of a three-year process uh, that they got, they were able to measure those reductions. So we know that these can work. The thing is, how do you scale it up across a whole, a whole neighborhood, which tend to be rather isolated, small areas? Um, awesome. But we do, we do feel like the, the collective programs have a much stronger chance of, of success over the long term because because you get this sort of um, what's the word sort of momentum across a whole community and you, and you get competition between between different neighbors friendly competition and that's not usually been scaled up before the the climate emergency has made all this suddenly all more possible it was very hard to get funding to <laughs> support these programs previously thank you that and just one, one last question thank you through you mayor 
Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shepard. My concern and bias, I suppose, is that I, I hope there's a role for municipalities because I think this needs to be extended as well to land use and urban planning um, over time. And I'm just wondering how these two might integrate with one another because after all, climate change is holistic and it's Absolutely. it's looking at, you know across the, the environment. So um, I guess I, I'm hoping that to sustain programs like this, that municipalities will have a role in that through an environmental advisory body, for instance, you know, beyond a, a task group. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And uh, Mr. I might just turn it to Mr. Heidley as well. It might just be worth noting. There is an, uh, on the municipal side, of course, we also have the urban forest, uh, tree protection bylaw, urban forest strategy, tree protection bylaws up for adoption this afternoon, this evening. Um, and I just want to touch base on that too, because I'm assuming this would dovetail with that, those efforts to encourage planting on private property as well as public. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yes, one of the objectives of the urban forest strategy is to get 4,800 trees onto private land. That, from my perspective, is is the biggest challenge of the, uh, well, or one of the biggest challenges of the urban forest strategy to be a success. This would certainly complement uh, that endeavor quite nicely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions of council? No? Okay, we can. Yes, Councillor Appleton. <laughs> I need hands. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just, before we, uh, before we let Dr. Shepard go, I would be remiss as, as chair of the Community Climate Action Work Group for not thanking Dr. Shepard directly for making the, making the trip and coming to bring this information before council. I really, really appreciate it. Um, we have many of the folks that came to the Climate Action Work Group uh, to speak in favor of a community action. You, uh, many of your champions that would participate in such a program are actually already in the room. Uh, and so I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge them. Um, I will say that as uh, somebody who's, before I was doing this role, that who's somebody who spent 10 years on the ground working in environmental nonprofits doing community uh, engagement work exactly as is what is described here, um, I will just take this opportunity to say that my experience there is very much in support of the fact that if you have a program uh, to leverage community uh, energy and community resources, it certainly can be successful, um, but it certainly does not come uh, at, at zero investment, that uh, a modest investment up front in resources and tools to help support the community and support the champions that want to take this type of thing forward um, is, is multiplied many times over. Uh, but I, I will definitely speak uh, in, in favor and, and uh, with my experience that this type of uh, investment is, is, is key in getting those types of programs off the ground and, and getting to be successful. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite and Nay. Um, thank you, Entering you, Chair. Um, just kind of going on um, the, the cost, et cetera, I noticed on one of your slides, Dr. Shepard, you talked about, um, I think it was the Training Neighborhood Champions in Killarney, and it looked like you had a lot of um, help from perhaps the school board as a funding partner. And so can you talk maybe a little bit about um, that and how that perhaps came about? Because um, for a small community like ours, it, it, the, the price tag is expensive, I think, um, and so I'd like to know really about um, funding partners and um, perhaps you can also touch on how much staff time, like of the municipal staff time, would there be an expect expectation of? Okay. Um, so in the past, we've um, certainly had, uh, we've had funding directly, the Kalani work is directly funded by uh, the Park Board in Vancouver. Um, but we have supplemented their funds. We had a neighborhood matching grant from them, um, and we've supplemented that with uh, a federal research program that we've been working on for two years, a uh, Shirk Partnership Development Grant, uh, which is unfortunately coming to an end. Um, but um, so because we've been using um, uh, that program to do a lot of the background research to develop and test the tools, um, we've sort of leveraged that through through the uh, park board. We have had uh, some additional funding from Vancouver School Board. That was actually a, a previous year when we did a lot of testing in the high schools, and we developed pro D day materials for teachers, etc. So, um, you know, I, I, I 
think we should be very clear that there are m many different levels at which support can be provided from a community-based research group like ours. Um, and we see ourselves very much in the role of, of advising, training, providing resources. Um, there's nothing says we have to deliver it. Um, we're very happy if NGOs want to deliver it or city staff want to deliver it. Um, that's really the long-term goal. Um, the issue is establishing you know, the precedence for a rollout of a program and making sure that that works well. Um, I think those do have to be co-designed and very often they are co-funded. And so we're always looking for funding. We've also had support from foundations um, from time to time. I think FCM is another possibility in the future. Um, so, so we're very happy to play whatever role um, um, uh, is required. And um, we'd, we'd, we'd love to do this uh, project as planned to just make sure it, it works and get it going well. Um, but we're equally happy just to work with whoever's there to and advise them or, or help train them and then and let them run it too. So, <coughs> so, so just um, uh, but I think joint funding is uh, in the long term probably a way to go to to make sure there is uh, some staff time and much of that you know, or some of that at least can be in house. I, I won't speak to the specifics of that. Um, we have not actually estimated. I don't think the staff time yet in our in our proposal, but I'm sure we could discuss that further. Thank uh, you, Dr. Shepard. Uh, so just a, a follow up, yeah, because that would be one of the concerns that I would have is um, how much of our staff time would be taken. Um, and so, yes, I think what, I've he what I'm hearing you saying is that um, the end game is really to have a commitment from a, an NGO to come in and run this program and not necessarily have it run through the municipality. Um, well, I think that's completely up to the municipality. So for, uh, there are examples like the uh, Toronto Regional Conservation Authority where they have uh, full-time staff dedicated to things like energy retrofitting through a neighborhood program that, that shares some similarities to this. Um, and there are other models where it's all done by an NGO with city support. I, I mean, I do think the municipality does have a key role. Uh, at, at all times, even if it's a, a modest staff time role, just to sort of provide support, provide some expertise, and and, uh, and endorse the program. But I think there's sort of iterations from complete NGO, completely in-house, or somewhere in between. Thank you, Dr. Shepard. Dr. Telser Ney. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I, you know, in principle. Um, uh, Dr. Shepard, thank you very much for coming over and, and uh, sharing your work you've done and what you propose to do here. And um, I, like others at the, at the table here, um, really endorse this bottom-up grassroots um, approach in, in principle. And, um, and I, I do understand that this is really the challenge we have as we try to move forward in with our climate action initiatives is to uh, engage and mobilize and sustain our neighborhoods, our local people, in uh, taking responsibility for um, these initiatives. So um, I, I really see how this has promised. I have a couple questions for clarification to you. So um, one of them, uh, I, I might have misunderstood the presentation, but I was looking at the slide on the Green Block 2018 yep. uh, outcomes. Was so. Um, you talked a bit about some of the evaluation you do around knowledge, uh, awareness, um, uh, et cetera. But are you also measuring other impacts? Are, is this green block uh, outcome research done by your research group, or is that? No, we, are, we have a partnership with Evergreen, and so we have uh, shared resources and tracked what they've done. But no, this was not done by us. Okay. Uh, but it's a very similar neighborhood-based. It's not quite as granular as what as what we're proposing and what we think is the most effective. Um, it, it, this is a program that has gone on. I think the original Green Block process, which was just in one of those neighborhoods in Riley Park, was actually a block-focused thing, okay. which is closer to what we're we're proposing because we've seen the most traction with that. 
Okay, that they've, I, I understand. They've, they've gone to a slightly more dispersed model where they get uh, keeners from various neighborhoods. Okay. But in some ways it's very similar. But no, it, we did not conduct this, but we review and monitor those so that we can uh, learn from them, really. Right. Well, so that leads to the next question. So I'm wondering, um, you are researchers, and I'm wondering if there's any anything built into your budget or if that's where your your free time comes from, Dr. Shepard, with all due respect. Is there going to be some kind of outcome impact evaluation? This will be over the course of three years. Is that the intent here? I, I say that really because I, I really like this kind of yeah. a... Uh, a, um, a partnership with uh, with a research institute and a community. I, I know from personal experience it's good for universities to be community engaged, but it's also a good benefit for the community here. So my question to you is, um, is it your intent after the year, three years, will we have information about what impact this um, intervention has had on our community? Uh, yes, uh, yes, absolutely. So. Uh, and I should have, I'm sorry, I didn't mention that, but um, what we routinely do with the workshops, we usually do before and after testing, and when it's either a single workshop or a series of workshops on what they've learned, what they take away, what their motivation is. And in this case, because it's a, a longer program, we certainly hope to track actual behavior change and uh, you know installations, particularly visible installations in the community that can be seen and shared by many people. We think one of the reasons these um, these changes are not happening very much is because they're not visible, and people are not aware of how it's done. <coughs> but when you when you uh, can show demo projects, walk them through what a heat pump looks like, how it works, and and someone who's a neighbor tells you, as opposed to some energy expert or researcher or something, that's that's very powerful. And I think we just need many more of those examples. Um, and we want to be able to track those and show them and publicize them. So we do want to document uh, what has actually happened. That's part of the problem with many pilots run by NGOs is they're not tracked. Uh, I think Evergreen has done a, a good job of doing that here, um, and we've advised them on some of their surveys and things like that. Uh, you know, I would not say this is a, a massive sort of scientific uh, full survey kind of exercise, but it's certainly interviewing um, and getting <coughs> getting the participants and the champions to to document for us you know what they've learned what they've seen and also what the barriers and problems are I mean w we will run into barriers there will be setbacks sometimes or people don't agree on things occasionally um, as you know well um, but but again those are, that's how we learn that's how we improve the program well, I appreciate your response because as a, as a public funder, we need to be accountable to our public. That's one part of it. But the other, I, I fully agree with you that uh, that information can be valuable just for a learning experience to move things on, but also reinforcing to our community to really uh, yeah. keep the momentum moving to see what has actually been accomplished. So are you saying then that would actually be a deliverable to the program? Yes, we yeah. would normally do a, a report at the end, uh, sort of a summary report of the findings and results, and, and I think I would strongly recommend that if, if there is a mechanism um, at, at the district level to put this kind of information on a website so that it's easily uh, available to everybody and is perhaps promoted, some celebratory events. Um, so there's both, I think, a scientific component of it, a sort of documenting it in a way that I mean, we'd love to publish a paper on it at some mm -hmm. point, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but more importantly, I think, is to get a, um, uh, a clear record and a clear demonstration of what's actually been done. And I, I'm just going to say one more thing, if I may, Mr. Mayor. But um, I, you know, um, this is really about supporting initiatives to support green infrastructure in our community that will address climate change issues and I I mean I, others have said at the table here but I I just I think this is really good bang for your buck the budget if we get good deliverables uh, at which I'm confident that we would here but for three dollars and 65 cents per residential home if if we could possibly 
I mean, you talk about visioning. What I'm imagining here that we mobilize this community to a way to make some real significant gains on the issues um, that Mr. Hyde Lee has been working on around the planting of trees and other initiatives that are mentioned in the staff report. I think that's really good value. And when you think how much we're having to spend on built infrastructure, millions and millions of dollars. This is um, a real small amount of money to support a green infrastructure that could have so much um, benefit to our community. So thank you again very much for sharing what you've. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ney. I have uh, first time questions. Uh, so Councillor Patterson and then back to Councillor Green. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Dr. Shepard, for, for being here tonight. Uh, it, and given us a presentation, it's been very interesting, and I can certainly understand where programs of this nature could um, broaden the outreach um, and support for district staff in these initiatives. I'm just wondering about the, the budget that is provided. Um, the budgets, when they're developed, are they developed on the um, in proportion to the scale of the neighborhoods that they're developed for, and and to go further to that, is there an ideal scale of, um, of land mass that works best for the programs? Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll take those two questions uh, separately, but they're, they're clearly connected. So, uh, so there is effectively a budget by scale. Um, what we found is that if we're, if we're um, using the workshops that have been successful and effective for us in the past, and again, similarly for programs like Green Block and some of the transition work that's been done, <coughs> that there's a limit to the number of people uh, you can easily accommodate in a room and serve. Obviously, if you have you know, an army of helpers, you could probably do a big, a big workshop. But you, a lot of it depends on getting to know people and you know, building trust and, and them having fun and feeling like they can talk about their uh, experiences and sharing that amongst themselves and so if you get too many people you'd be there for you know six hours just listening to everybody whereas if you have 25 people maybe probably 30 max um, uh, then people have a voice they can sit in groups small groups and it's much more you know, collegial I suppose it's it's just more friendly that way we've we've had uh, success with that and I think that puts a limit on it and the other thing is that um, your question about scale is really important. Um, y those could be people who are really interested, you know, the, 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 the obvious champions, the ones of the keeners, um, and they could be from across Oak Bay or across Victoria, for example. But what you're really looking for are ones that have a geographic connection. Uh, they know some of the same people, they use some of the same resources, they are in some way actually neighbors. And so, uh, it's really helpful to have a sort of a density of people in the same overall neighborhood. We are still, uh, that's why I, I put this little map in, we are still uh, clarifying exactly what that is, but we feel that these, this size of a, of a, of a larger neighborhood, uh, you know, one third of Oak Bay in this case as a small municipality, um, has enough sort of commonality in in the land use and the you know the, the character of the trees and the buildings and the streets um, that uh, a solutions in one part would would probably work reasonably well in in another part um, and more importantly you're using that net local network um, because the question came up could we you know could we share a cost with Victoria and and I think in some ways you can for individual training workshops but I think you'd lose that identity of you know, what is Oak Bay or what is my part of Oak Bay. And that's really that sense of place, a sense of this is my hood, literally, uh, is, is really important and we really want to capture that. That's where quite a lot of the research evidence suggests that's a really powerful motivator. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, Councillor Green, you have another question? Yes, um, it has partially been answered, but through you, I'm Dr. Shepard. I think you're absolutely right. Um, we have a North Central and South Oak Bay roughly breakdown in terms of area planning. Um, we have some neighborhood associations, not as many as I think we would probably need to do it on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. But if it's a train the trainer, it could be done. 
in North Central and South Oak Bay, on that kind of a breakdown, I yeah. think you're right, there's enough commonality in each of the areas, but anyway, thank you. That's helpful, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just have a couple of questions myself, if I, uh, all other ones being expired. Uh, do you have, uh, Dr. Shepard, do you have a breakdown of the cost for the Clarny project, what the total cost for that work was? Um, I, I, I more or less, <laughs> sorry, we haven't actually added it up because um, we have, uh, uh, and, and so let me also uh, explain. The, the Kilani project, um, the money runs out when we finish this series of workshops and we're having a celebratory tree planting event, but uh, we are not going beyond a, a relatively small number of champions. The difference with, the, in other words, it's all happening in a sort of a two-month period. Uh, what the what the one year gives us, or the you know nine months, given uh, things like planting season and things like that, um, is the ability to roll it out into the neighborhoods and into the citizens. So that's a that's a bigger project. Um, but I can give you a, a ballpark estimate if you don't quote me on it. Um, we had, I think, from uh, Park Board directly, we had seven thousand um, dollars, and then we had um, a couple of thousand dollars from uh, an earlier project from the Vancouver School Board that we were able to use, and then we've probably uh, about doubled that with the federal funding that we had, um, and that is, as I say, to. Uh, develop the training materials and the guide that we're producing for the champions and run these three main workshops. So what's missing from that is uh, those are all uh, two and a half hour workshops. So we basically, um, you know, these are small increments of time with a relatively small number of champions with, we'd love to do much more than this, but, but Park Board only could go so far. Um, so rolling that out into the communities would be the next step, and currently that's not funded. Um, w they do have some n uh, neighborhood organizations that may be able to take on part of that, um, but it's a much smaller scale uh, trial of the training program. My only other question, uh, and I appreciate all the council asking all these great questions. Yep. They, uh, they covered most of the things I could think of to ask. Uh, was just the, if the, is there any of these cool kits uh, that have gone forward uh, that have a, uh, a measurable number of, say, new trees planted? I know you don't have greenhouse gas reductions and those sorts of things, but has there been any sort of before and after surveys of looking at changes in, in actual behavior on the ground? Um, n no, not explicitly, although I can tell you where some of those trees have been planted, but um, um, for two reasons. One is uh, we've not had uh, a sustained program um, where we've been able to roll out, yeah, I think I showed you this, um, this, this model, uh, where, where is it, this one. Um, what we've been doing is sort of testing different pieces of it, and the ones in green here are the parts that we're testing as part of that current workshop. Um, we are hoping to get to that end point um, and be able to track how many trees are planted um, to show, you know, from beginning to end in a more sustained way than we have in the past. We've been, we've been developing the tool and, and not having uh, the ability yet to track it. However, having said that, we do know that some trees have been planted. Uh, I actually know where they are. This is, these are trees that were provided by Park Board. We did block parties and uh, various trees were, were used. The other problem w we have is that um, the cool kit is being used by a number of people um, without our knowledge. That's its purpose is teachers are using it. And so we know we're using it. It's very difficult to track it. And we wish we had a better method. Um, we are looking at some of those things like the tree tracker that Victoria is using as, as, a, as an example of how we could track a specific thing. Again, okay. it's not only focused on tree planting, it's focused on uh, you know, the, uh, many different aspects of climate, so it's a little hard to track. We, we would very much love to do exactly that. So I can't unfortunately give you loads of good numbers yet, it's just not enough time. All right, no, it's fair enough. I just uh, was curious if there was an example. Yeah, we'd love um, to have it. <laughs> uh, if there are any other questions? If not, we're just uh, we need a motion to receive the information. I move. Moved. Second. Seconded. Thank you very much. 
Uh, all those in favor? Opposed, then opposed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shepard. This Thank is very, very, very interesting, and, and I really appreciate your time tonight to uh, to make yourself available to answer the questions that were the Council had. So thank you so much. No problem. I appreciate the opportunity. With that, we are moving to item number five. We have a request for financial assistance, the Ride Don't Hide event. Um, who should I pass this over to to give a quick overview? Ms. Hopkins. Senator. Your Worship, this is uh, a request from the Ride Don't Hide event for funding that the, the district has previously provided in the past for the same event. Uh, what they're asking for is a grant that will cover the cost of the police marshalling. There is no change in the estimated cost on uh, from the opinion of uh, our police department. Uh, so this is a, a, a similar request as in previous years. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll make the motion to approve the request. Second. Move and second. Is there any discussion or questions? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, unopposed, thank you. Um, we have minutes, uh, the two sets of minutes, February 20th and 24th from the Standing Committee on Park Rec and Culture. Move, move uh, receipt. Second. Move and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, not opposed, thank you. And uh, new business and verbal reports. Is there any new business tonight? Seeing any? Uh, report on the Capital Regional District. I, we have not had a meeting since my last meeting, so we'll, uh, we'll leave it from there. And uh, other verbal reports. And I would, can I start at one end? Uh, Councillor Green, can you give a quick update? Okay, thank you very much. Um, just to let you know that the tourism meeting um, that was scheduled for this week has been changed to next week. I'm going to forward an email to you. Thanks, Mayor. Um, the BIA, BIA mixer has been cancelled um, for this coming week and is rescheduled for sometime in May, a date to, to, to be determined. And I also enjoyed attending very much the Yes Awards. Um, thanks to uh, Hazel Braithwaite and Andrew for that and everyone that attended. It was very good. Um, and <laughs> Bless you. Um, I also attended the volunteer dinner, uh, and then I attended um, a meeting on Friday with Councillor uh, Patterson and two residents on the on their concerns around the J Jubilee transportation plan proposal. So it, it was it was a busy sort of ten days in the end. But thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. Councillor Green, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thank you, and thanks for bringing up the Yes Awards, um, Councillor Green. Um, we did manage to celebrate 10 wonderful students um, and um, give them um, some accolades at um, the Oakby Beach Hotel, and it was um, attended by all of Council, which I really appreciate. And um, we had great support from our community as well. Uh, and uh, just congratulations to those students. Thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. Councillor Appleton. Oh, thank you, Worship. I, I too had a great time at the Yes Awards, and, and thanks to Councillor Braithwaite for all of her organization, as per usual. We're we're both members of the organizing crew, but uh, Councillor Braithwaite does ninety five percent of the work, so I just feel like that should be acknowledged for the minutes. Um, in terms of uh, external responsibilities, uh, Greater Victoria Public Library Board met on February the 25th. Um, the ongoing strategic planning process that I've mentioned to uh, Council in the past uh, is, is just kicking off and just launching right now. Uh, there's, there's a couple of different moving parts to that, but I will keep uh, Council apprised as it, as it moves forward. Um, one item that is being considered by the Library Board right now, which I think might be of interest to Council, is, is that the library board is revising their room booking policy. Uh, the, there's actually a new system coming online for booking of rooms, and so it's the, we're taking the advantage to uh, revise the room booking policy. As council is well aware, um, with uh, issues with uh, you know, challenges that have been faced in Oak Bay with uh, renting out uh, of civic facilities and, and who may and under what conditions uh, does freedom of speech and, uh, and, and protection of the public interest come into play in that type of thing. Obviously we had direct experience with that here uh, in our community so uh, we are now doing that at the library board level so I will keep council apprised. I think I, I did inform council that uh, they were very interested to hear from Oak Bay about their experience and, and what had happened so uh, and then there is actually a provincial level policy document coming out on this uh, city of Vancouver 
and uh, well, City of Vancouver has has expedited their process on this topic. So, uh, just for interest's sake, um, and then I will also just mention the Community Climate Action Work Group uh, had its final meeting on March the third uh, last week. The final two recommendations were arrived upon. Uh, in, in addition, some supporting information, some contextual. Uh, information. The report on those last two recommendations is coming forward to Committee of the Whole on the 16th, so stay tuned for that. Um, again, uh, this work only gets done through the uh, through the, the assiduous work of staff, and specifically Ms. Jensen, uh, who works overtime to try and make this work happen. So it's been uh, a real a real success. So uh, and and I appreciate uh, Council's interest in the recommendations. Thus, the reason we're having this conversation tonight on the cool kit. So I really appreciate that. Uh, more information to come. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. Councillor Zelka. Nothing, Councillor Patterson, anything to? Uh, well, just I can re follow up still on the Francophony um, uh, event that will be held here this year. March 5th, I attended the Francophony Day event at the legislature in my, in my role as acting mayor. Um, and it was, a, it was a great little event. We were joined by three of the athletes who will be participating in the Francophonie Games. There will be a 1,000-plus youth participating in the Games, which will be held here July 14th through the 18th. I should add that um, Oak Bay was acknowledged as being one of the sponsors of the Games, and um, we were thanked for the fact that participants will be accommodated at Oak Bay High School and Willows Elementary School. And I did learn there they are adding a new event to the arts component of the program this year. It's culinary arts. So I think that's really fitting for a Francophonic Games. You know, the food is a very important part of it. So, but it was a fun event and everybody had a good time. And we did have quite, we got samples of some of the culinary um, event. Thank you, Councillor Patterson, and thank you for filling in on that as well, Councillor Nigger. Uh, I guess the only other thing I should probably just give a little update on as well was the um, uh, the Transit Commission. I just uh, drew your thing. So there was uh, at the last Transit Commission now a couple of weeks ago, uh, a number of items come forward. There was a motion re resubmitted by City of Victoria about uh, it wasn't actually to implement free public or free youth transit, but it was to to, to look at a study a business case for that, uh, cost implications, et cetera, uh, which was defeated on a, on a split vote. Um, well, I supported it. I do actually recognize when I also just say I recognize the reasons for the, for the, for the, those who voted against that. Uh, there is a lot of work going on right now at that table. And, and it's one of the interesting things that came out of that conversation later in the, um, meeting, um, was just some of the impacts of the investments made into the rapid bus lanes, uh, and the service improvements that have gone on and uh, just the West Shore connector has gone up by over 4,000 riders in the last three years um, And that's obviously taking significant distance and so those the, there's a lot of infrastructure required to sort of keep ach Achieving sort of some of the low-hanging fruit and that was ultimately in the balance of things the 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 feedback I heard at that meeting was that the, the you know the best place to invest that money was to continue investing in the infrastructure and I I do respect that I think that was a reasonable piece I just uh, but there we go that was my my take of that meeting uh, certainly really appreciated the debate that actually happened at the table that was respectful and thoughtful uh, and really a lot of shared goals and just the question of how we achieve those so um, that's it for new business and new verbal reports uh, we have one more item on the agenda which is we've already done first second and third reading so we need a motion to adopt bylaw four seven. Four, two. So moved. Second. Moved and second. And those for those in the audience, this is the revised tree protection bylaw, which is a significant and important part of our uh, of our efforts to uh, one of the many facets of the urban forest um, strategy. Uh, with that, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed? Move adjournment. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed? Thank you very much.